Hi everyone, my name is Jay Sable and I'm the Executive Director of the One Community 501c3 nonprofit organization. The purpose of our organization is to operate for the highest good of all and to positively and permanently transform the world for everyone and everything living here. The way that we're doing this is by building open source and free shared blueprints for complete sustainable civilizations covering every aspect of the human experience including highest good food, energy, housing, education, for-profit, non-profit business models, uh, true earth stewardship, as well as highest good society model, which includes the concept of living and creating for the highest good of all and creating an environment that is maximally supportive of cooperation, collaboration, and working together to solve the most pressing problems of our generation and all generations to come. Ultimately, what we want to do is create solution models that create additional solution creating models. And this is what our blueprints are all about. This is what our open source and free sharing strategy is all about. And it's happening right now. So um, before I jump into our update, I want to say that we are always looking for other people who want to join us. We are the ones that we've been waiting for. This has been going on now for three years. We've been hard at work creating what we're creating and um, somebody's got to do it. The time has come to build a planet that works for everybody. And that's possible. We have the technology. We have the brain power. We have the will. And so we are reaching out to the people that have the time and the energy that want to do this as we work together to build open source and free shared models and share everything that we do as we do it so that other people can duplicate it in the way that works best for them to modify it, to evolve it, and to transform it into a thousand different iterations of ways to improve living on this planet for everybody. The Philippines just got decimated by a typhoon. What would it be like if open source blueprints existed so that people could go and rebuild that area with sustainable infrastructure that would be better than what was just decimated, what was just destroyed, would really produce a higher quality food, would have sustainable energy, would be with green, eco-friendly building materials that would last hundreds of years and would survive the next typhoon? What would that be like? That's what we want to create. More importantly, we want to create a model that is compelling enough that people want to invest in it. So the money in the middle class and in, in the uh, more developed countries will be invested in creating this infrastructure and not just sustainable housing, food, and energy, those are just the basics. Those, those, are, those are what's needed most right now, arguably in the third world countries, but also education infrastructure, business infrastructure, self-governance, social architecture that goes along with it with a more fulfilled way of living, and teaching people what they need to be able to contribute for the highest good of all of themselves, of their local community, of their larger community, of their country, and of the planet. Working together as a global cooperative and collaborative to create a planet that works for everybody. This is happening right now. This is what we're doing. So this is our update. This is our weekly update. Every week we do a video update. There's always a written blog that goes along with this. It takes us about 24 hours from the time that we post this video to finish the written blog. But if you want to go to that written blog, you can click on the link in the YouTube description down below. And you can read the written blog, which will have links to all of our open source content, all the details that we're talking about, all the free shared information, everything that I'm talking about, the most recent updates, everything from the last week, as well as links to everything that we've been working on for years. And for me, this has been a 15-year process before we started the three-year full-time process. All those details are, are on the website, and you can access those through the weekly written blog as well. Or just go to our website, onecommunityglobal.org forward slash one dash community dash blog and you can see our weekly updates blog as they continue. This is weekly update blog number 37, and it's covering our progress for the week of November 4th, 2013. The uh, format of these blogs is always the same. I'm going to go through a quick bullet point of everything that we've accomplished, and then I'll come back and I'll talk a little bit more in depth about those details. So the bullet points of everything that we've accomplished in the last week are we finished the SketchUp plant database research. All that is done. Uh, we've got Zenapini number two, which is the last of our six initial food infrastructure pieces. All the plants are done behind the scenes, and 50% of those are now complete and up on the site. 
Um, behind the scenes, we've finished editing all 300 of the Food Forest plant pictures. So our Food Forest has uh, just under 300 different plants, and we finished editing all the photos for that. So that's pretty exciting. The Aquapini filtration and water flow updates are now done. So for large-scale Aquapini, which is the same, very almost identical uh, design as the uh, Xanapini 1 and Xanapini 2, which is a combination of Aquapini, aquaponics and wallapini design. Uh, we've also finished our plastic research, which is done. We're going with twin-walled, six-foot wide polycarbonate clear panels, and we're starting to put together an open source um, strategy for testing all of the second choices. There are a whole bunch of other things that we're looking at. I'll talk about this in a minute. And so we're creating an open source strategy for testing all those things so we can have a real definitive answer on which one works best because everybody's product seems to be the best product and we really want to know. It's an open source organization. That's what we're all about. Uh, Earthbag Village furniture design number one is about 70% done as far as the Murphy bed design with the two walk around closets and the loft. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, thanks to Philip Gill. Uh, Straw Bale Village stairs and entryways are all done in CAD now. So Straw Bale Village is the second village model that we will build and open source free share. The work being done on that is thanks to Dave Wallen. Excellent work. Um, Sego Center kitchen design is now 80% done. So maybe even 90%, but it's really, I mean, complete details on that. We put in all of the major appliances. We've put in all of the, uh, you know, the sinks are in there, all the cabinets and everything are in there. So really coming together, cleaning closet, all that stuff. You can see images on the blog. Um, and the Education for Life program, the open source Education for Life, the geography research is now done, and we're researching icons. We've still got to do research on law, research on psychology, and research on cultural studies to finish up the social sciences section, and then we should be able to start putting that together. So while that's happening, we're also doing research on all the icons necessary for the math infrastructure. I'll talk about that a little bit more here in a second. And then uh, last but not least, uh, we did updates to our Stages of Community pay, uh, building page on the website, as well as uh, updating our True Community page, which are really the foundations of the highest good society model and everything that we are creating. And maybe that's a good segue. Well, I'll start at the beginning and go through it, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So um, back to the top, open source sustainability or open source sustainable civilization building, uh, all aspects of that. The foundations would be the things that people need to live. And so we call these foundations physical sustainability. So those key areas I talked about um, are all the food, energy, housing, the duplicable city hub that we're designing as well. And then the other aspect is the emotional sustainability. This is the highest good society aspects. This is the highest good for all philosophy. This is the idea of uh, open source and free shared education. It's addressing crime. It's addressing poverty. It's addressing social injustice and inequality. Obviously, it's just addressing education. It's addressing highest good for-profit and non-profit business design. design. Businesses designed to support their local communities and to give more than they take to be positive and proactive in what's happening in the world right now. So, um, so at the back to the beginning, uh, I said that we've got our SketchUp plant database research is done. Uh, what that means is we're creating, we've, we realize that we need to do 3D models of everything that we're doing. We have some really complex and interesting plants. If you've seen any of our food infrastructure, and I'll talk about Zenopini 2 here in just a second, uh, the goal is not just to teach people how to be food self-sufficient, but it's to evolve the complete concept of how we look at food. For the first time in the history of the world, we have the ability to access easily access plant information and plant material from all over the world. And so our organization has been researching it for months and months and months, looking at how we get the best plants with the most amazing nutritional benefits, medicinal benefits, and culinary uses so that we can grow food that is far superior to what you can buy in the grocery store. So we can produce food that is locally grown, that has higher nutritional benefits and values, and uh, tastes better than what you can get in the grocery store. And not because we want to put the grocery stores out of business, because we want to evolve what's offered at the grocery stores. We want to give people an opportunity to grow super high quality food that they can then offer at local farmers markets, that they could then sell to grocery stores, that they could then sell to restaurants as they build a, a movement of people that are interested in diverse food. 
you know, that would like as many flavors of apple as we have flavors of potato chips. Doesn't that seem like a good idea? That would like a diversity of vegetables to choose from like we have a diversity of candy to choose from. So, you know, the goal of open source sustainable civilizations is to reinvent society in a way that works better than the way we are currently doing it and give people that option, that opportunity. If people don't agree that what we're creating is the best way to do it, then that's fine. Then don't, don't use what we're doing. But we want open source and free shared solutions. And so the SketchUp plant database is looking at all the plants that were available, hundreds of them. We researched hundreds and hundreds of plants. Everybody that had a plant on SketchUp, we not only looked at their plant, then we looked at their entire collection of plants to see what kind of quality stuff we have available there that we can then use in these 3D models that we're creating. And so um, that database, all that research is now done. We found the best of the best that's out there. And next what we're going to do is go through and now this week, we're going through and we're listing on that everything that that plant could look like. So there's not a huge variety out there and we haven't decided if we want to start creating a bunch of plants yet or if we're just going to create the database. We've got so much that we're working on. We might create plants where there's nothing that looks like it because the diversity of food that we're growing is far beyond what most people have ever even heard of. And so there's definitely not plants in SketchUp 3D that represent that. But there's a lot of plants that are similar. And so that's what we're doing is we want to create that database and uh, we've done all the research on what's available, and so now we're going to add in the additional research to what can what those plants can be substituted for, so that people that are doing landscaping and complex landscaping pro projects have a place to go where they can say, "Okay, well, I can't find this exact plant, but this one looks very similar, and it's chosen by professionals that know exactly what these look like, are botanists, or horticulturists, the people that really study this kind of stuff." So they can say, hey, this is you could use this and substitute it. And really, unless you're an expert, you're not going to know the difference. So we're excited to create that plant database because it's something that we're going to use, something that we think other people really value. And it's definitely um, a useful contribution from an open source and free share um, perspective and something that we'll use forever. So and we think other people will too when they start duplicating what it is that we're doing. Uh, also, I said that we finished 50% of the Zen Aquapini plants are now up on the website. A Zen Aquapini, for people that don't know what that is, is a combination of aquaponics and a wallapini, which is an in-ground food production structure. They're cheaper to uh, heat and cool. They're cheaper to build. And the plants that we're growing within these structures, each of our structures represents a different internal environment because we want to demonstrate that pretty much anywhere in the world you can produce a tropical environment, a cloud forest environment, an arid desert, uh, uh, desert environment, each of these different environments as part of our open source botanical garden model. And so uh, Zenopini number two plants are 50% up on the website. You go take a look at what those are. And the purpose of the Zenopinis is to uh, open source and free share a greenhouse structure that is lower profile. I mean, it takes up less visible space in somebody's backyard. And it'll be permitted so that you can build it pretty much anywhere that'll allow you to build something like that because you have permits with permits. And you'll be able to produce uh, food that you can't buy in a grocery store. Enough to share. Enough to share with your entire block. Enough to share with several blocks to start helping people to build community. And we're looking at this as a way to create something like this in urban environments, but also imagine being able to go build hundreds of these in an area like the Philippines, you know, to produce food that you might not already be able to grow there. So, or to produce environments that would be different from what's there, or to produce, um, you know, to create a, an industry there, something like that, or anywhere in the world. And so this is the idea, and we really want to create it for the mainstream. And so we call it a Zen Aquapini, because not only does it produce this amazing diversity of food, but the internal environment is specifically designed to be a really beautiful place to hang out, a really wonderful place to go and sit and enjoy um, you know, just drinking a cup of tea or reading a book or having a conversation or playing a game or just teaching your kids about plants, that kind of stuff. And so that's why we call it a Zen Aquapini because it really also has a huge recreational aspect. It's a big part of the highest good society and social architecture model of one community and um, really something very, very beautiful. So we're excited to have 50% of those plants up on the site um, and, uh, and to be moving forward on that with a little bit of luck. We might finish that. It's really more than 50%. Might finish that in this coming week. Uh, if not, definitely the week after that. So, pretty cool. Um, we, I said we finished behind the scenes. 
we've also finished all the editing of the photos for the food forest. So our food forest currently page currently has over almost 300, 290 something different uh, amazing plants that will be grown outside in our environment for one community. We'll be open sourcing the details of all that as well, how to grow those plants, how to cook and eat those plants, how to use them for all kinds of different things. And so we've researched, all our team has researched all of those plants and now we've finished the editing of all of the pictures that go along with those so that we can put those up on the websites with complete descriptions including the description of the plant, the picture of course, and then cultural considerations, planting guidelines, how we'll be receiving the plants on the Food Force page. I reported in a couple weeks ago we already did all the research on where you can purchase all of these plants which was, uh, God, I think it was, I've totally forgotten how many it was. I want to say a hundred different nurseries that we've um, researched for sourcing all that plant material. And so um, now that the pictures are done, it's just a process of the people that were working on those pictures now doubling up on getting them up on the website. So huge action item checked off. Very, very cool to have that done. And then I mentioned also still on food infrastructure, a lot of progress on food infrastructure this week. The aquapini, so the Zen aquapinis are smaller versions of the large-scale aquapini, which is huge food production, large-scale food production, lettuces and broccoli and that kind of stuff, and then all this other amazing foods, things that you can't buy in the grocery store, also incorporate into that. And so this week, Avery Ellis has done an update, uh, finished our update on the filtration and water flow for that large-scale aquapini. And so it's a huge change, actually, the way the design was before. It's removed a lot of excavation. It's going to make it a lot easier to get it permitted. It's going to require um, less power to run the whole thing. It's going to incorporate a really beautiful um, waterfall. And so uh, the design is really a huge improvement. A lot of work went into that between our team and, and cooperation with Avery Ellis, who's our aquaponics lead, and uh, doing the, the major design work on that. And so all that stuff is finished. And our 3D, our 3D team has also done some touch-up work on it. And so we've got some great images of those updates of that large-scale aquapini that are now going to be put up on the website. So uh, if you want to look at the written blog, you can see those updates and the different details. And you can scroll back and compare it to where it was before and see how much that's evolved because it has evolved a lot. We've been able to remove a couple staircases and a whole bunch of different stuff. So um, making it easier to duplicate, a lot easier to build. So that's done. And then I said we've got the plastic research is now done. So we finally settled after, God, I don't know, probably five weeks of research, calling different companies, talking to different companies, talking to China and saying, okay, well, what can you send us? What do you have you know, to offer us as far as if we want to buy a container of plastic and have it shipped over here? What is the best option for the aquapinis, the wallapinis, the xenopinis, all these things, as well as the tropical atrium, which is the central food production structure for the uh, Earthbag Village. And so after all of that research, we have decided that the really the best choice appears to be twin-walled, um, six foot wide, because you can get it four foot or six foot wide. We're going wider because we'll have less seams, so it'll be easier to insulate and to maintain uh, temperature in there. Uh, six foot wide polycarbonate clear panels. So now with that, we looked at triple-walled polycarbonate, quintuple-walled polycarbonate, even five-layered polycarbonate. Um, we looked at Solex panels, which looked to be pretty good. And so in that whole process of saying, okay, we're going with twin-walled, six-foot-wide polycarbonate clear panels. We're going to go with a steel structure because it's going to last longer, be weather-resistant in a crazy situation that is, um, you know, that where there's, you know, huge hailstorms or huge snowstorms, rain, you know, it'll stand up to all that because we want to build things that are going to last uh, for, for decades, if not, in the case of the houses, for hundreds of years. You know, it's really what we're looking for is, is things that are far superior to what's being built right now. So in the case of these food infrastructures, after doing all that research and saying, hey, we've settled on this, we still have some questions, you know, because we're like, man, that seems like the best thing to do. But we're just not positive because there's nobody that's really, that we found, that's objectively um, comparing these things side by side. And so with that, where we realize, okay, well, we really want to test the triple-walled polycarbonate. We want to test the, test the uh, quadruple-walled polycarbonate. We want to test the Solex panels as well. And so we're doing the research now to see how much it will cost to do some simple greenhouse designs that will, that will test out those other materials so we can see them side by side, so we can do the research on exactly what the temperature difference would be 
inside two identical structures, one with triple-walled polycarbonate, one with double-walled polycarbonate, one with quintuple-walled polycarbonate. Like, how much benefit does that really make? And what's the, what's the durability differences on that? And so we're creating an open source strategy behind the scenes right now. That's the kind of stuff that we want to get done this week. And all that is going along with a big redesign of the large scale, all of the Aquapini, Wallapini roof designs, which right now are kind of a four slope design. And we've realized that going with an A-frame design, I'm talking to the architect, David Sweet, who's working on this and just looking at the different costs and things like that. Um, there aren't really any light benefits to doing it. There's not enough light benefit to doing it the way that we were going to do it to offset uh, the cost, the additional cost and the structural difficulties of building that way. So instead we're gonna go with an A-frame which will give us a lot more space on the inside on the east and the west walls as well as make it a lot more affordable and easy to build and construct. So we're in the process of doing that update as well and um, just uh, doing that roof redesign. And so hopefully we'll have some pictures of that within the next couple weeks as well. Um, other things I said, Earthbag Village furniture design continues to move forward uh, design number one with the help of Philip Gill. So for people who don't know, the Earthbag Village is maximally affordable sustainability. Our goal is to design an entire village model that includes food and energy infrastructure for under half a million dollars, $500,000 that will house 100 people which is pretty darn affordable. 100 people for $500,000 incorporates recreational space, food production, um, and is really beautiful and artistic. So the Earthbag Village designs are those designs. And these are being, we're, we want to design them so it's not just for third world countries. They're small home designs, you know, that are more like a dorm room or more of like a hotel room or uh, like a studio apartment kind of deal. But we're designing them with some really innovative furniture designs inside. And so uh, those continue to move forward, which is a Murphy bed design that folds down. I've got images that will be on the written blog as well. And that Murphy bed folds down. When it folds up, it opens up a desk that goes underneath that. And then when you walk around behind it, you've got a double um, closet where you've got closet storage, men's and women's closet storage, and a little ladder that actually goes up to more storage up above in a loft. And all this can be built in a 200-square-foot earth dome. And so these earth domes are super affordable to build. They'd be great for little guest houses for people who wanted to build sustainable guest housing, excuse me, guest housing in the back of their house. And, um, and our idea and the reason why they're 200 square feet is because a lot of counties don't require a permit for a 200 square foot structure. So we want to make it as easy as possible for people who can build in those environments. And on top of it, we're permitting everything. So ours will be all permitted, but for people who don't want to pull permits or think they're going to have a problem or whatever it is, you know, these 200 square foot structures, and we're going to actually build a 150 square foot structure as well for to demonstrate what that could look like and what's possible with that. These structures, these little teeny tiny structures, uh, will actually be very, very cozy, very, very homey, and really, really super easy to heat, super easy to cool, and just uh, really comfortable. And so... Earthbag Village Furniture Design Number One is about 70% complete. We're still going to put some details on it, but you know we're working out what that what that Murphy bed's going to look like because it'll be a load-bearing wall, and then um, you know over the top of that we've got the uh, loft, and so images are in the written blog. Check it out. Very very cool. Thank you, Philip Gill, for all your amazing work on that. Um, also, um, we've got some amazing Earthbag. Uh, so oh, um, new exports just for the Earthbag Village as a whole. Um, that are out now. And so I'll put those up thanks to the great work of Devin Porter. Um, some really beautiful renderings of the central structures within that. The inner circle of that, the tropical atrium with trees and plants are starting to look in there so that people can kind of get an idea now of how this is really going to look. You know, once we start putting plants in there and everything that we're growing in that area will be food producing plants. You know, so chestnut trees and some amazing shrubs and things like that all produce uh, food and herbs and that kind of stuff in that area. So um, all those details are starting to go along, as well as now in the Earthbag Village, uh, Devin Porter built our framing for the doors. Looks really good. We did some other touch-ups to the tops of the uh, the shower domes and the toilet domes. All those things are coming along. So we've got some amazing updates to that too. Great work at Devin Porter for the Earthbag Village, so it can kind of start to take form and see what a village like this will really look like, and go, wow, you can build that for half a million dollars, you know, for the cost of two or three homes in California, you could build housing for 100 people? Yes, you can. And so we're open source of free sharing all these plans. Exciting to see it come along like this. 
Uh, also, um, we've got updates thanks to Dave Wallen on the Straw Bale Village. So the Earthbag Village is maximally affordable, sustainable living. And so it's all about our, our all part of our highest good housing model, which is to demonstrate initially, just starting with seven different complete village models. So the second village model in the, in the set that we're building and ultimately one community will house starting with five, will work up to about 500 full-time residents. And then the goal is to expand that to be uh, the first sustainable city of 2,000 residents all working for the highest good of all, all collaborating on all the different aspects of the human experience and how to create solutions that create additional solutions and open source and free sharing all those details to evolve the entire concept of living and to give people what they need to build off of that and to launch it in new directions. And so um, we're excited to say the Straw Bale Village now in progressing in CAD, thanks to Dave Wallen, is uh, we've been working on the entryways to that. We've added in some more landscaping around this. You can see that and stairways are now in that. And so images of that are also up on the written blog. Check that out. Take a look at what we've got going on. And the Straw Bale Village, the point on that one, the first one being maximum, maximally affordable sustainability, the Straw Bale Village is maximally expandable sustainability. So the design that we've designed is a double torus. So it's got a circle within a circle, and you can see all this stuff on the website. So a circle within the circle, two rings of, of living residences, and then in the center is all of your food growing. You can have an orchard in the center there, as well as recreational space, a communal kitchen space, as well as communal laundry space, communal um, computer room space. And then, of course, everything would be wi is going to be Wi-Fi uh, connected as well, so people will be able to use their computers anywhere on the property. So, but the idea with all of this is this maximally sustainable model is how much food you produce in that central area could be hugely adapted to people's needs. The residences within the Straw Bale Village are designed so that you could do single residences or up to three or four or even more, as many rooms as you wanted to. So if you wanted to build a six bedroom house for some reason, you could do that, or you could have six studios. And it's just a matter of adding in doors. And it's even being designed so that you could adapt it and change it. Say, oh, we don't need two anymore. Now we need one. The way the bathrooms are all set up and everything is designed for maximum adaptability. And the design as a whole is designed so that it could be enlarged as far as the circle. If you want to build a bigger circle, you could take the same design and just make the circle bigger. Or you could take the same design, circular design, and create a snake-like design where you would build part of it and you could add on to it as a community or as a village or as a city grew and so you could actually expand this model continuing it on as long as you want and just adding on to it modularly and so um, it's a very very cool design Dave Wallen has done some really uh, amazing amazing uh, work on that and so uh, also um, the Sago Center kitchen design is now 80 percent done so what that means is we have completed the countertops, we completed all the shelving in the kitchen, um, we have completed the, uh, we had to do some trimming on where the sliding glass door entries are, and we put in a new storage closet, and we've added in the sinks, and so we're just working out all the details and the spacing to make sure that it's it works and that you've got enough room to move around in there and to do high-scale food production or large-scale food production so you can feed 150 to 200 people at a time within this one duplicable city center hub. You know, and the idea there is to save ridiculous amounts of resources by building something like this. If you build something like this, you can increase the, the uh, living capacity of any of the other villages because you're saving so much space and combining the resources to build an amazing kitchen, to build an amazing um, dining area, to build an amazing laundry facility, to build amazing recreational space. And so by building something like this, you then have a hub from which all of the rest of the villages can expand around. So any of the village malls could be built around it. They don't have to, but they could be expanded upon this. Or it could be a standalone, super sustainable, um, uh, LEED Platinum certified uh, structure that could be built anywhere in the world. And then you could, you could just have it as a standalone structure if you wanted to. Um, but it would still produce more than it takes, and it would be a great ecotourism destination. And this is where we tie in our highest good for-profit business and that kind of stuff. 
So Sago Center Kitchen Design, to understand what has been done in that, definitely go to the written blog, look at the pictures, check out our Facebook page if you want to see what we're updating. I always post these pictures there to facebook.com forward slash one community updates or one community fans. Uh, both of those are our Facebook pages. Check it out. Uh, and then last but not least, two other things, actually. Education for Life uh, program is moving forward. We've got our geography research done and we've started researching all the icons or rather all the images that are going to make up the different ma the different um, visual representations of what the entire education program is going to look like and so um, what I mean by that is last week we posted what the the math molecule, we call it the math molecule for reference but really what math looks like instead of a linear representation of math we created the circular representation of math so that students can move through the experience of math in the way that works best for them. And students that really find that they um, excel in geometry don't have to wait until they get to geometry to learn geometry. There's no reason why we couldn't teach a five-year-old geometry if they're really into geometry and basic geometry. I mean, shapes and things like that. But I'm talking about actual geometry, you know, really understanding lines and rays and building angles and all that kind of stuff, three-dimensional objects, and how that all works and calculating that kind of stuff out. Um, this is something that I'm doing with my five-year-old because he loves it because we made education super, super fun. And so because of that, he doesn't realize that he's learning. We never have to open a book. Instead, we just learn stuff. And he talks about acute angles and obtuse angles and right triangles and isosceles triangles, how it all works, and dodecagons, and octagons, and this kind of stuff. This is what we do. And so the Education for Life program is taking that and applying that concept to all subjects. And so um, now what we're doing is we've created mind maps or we're creating mind maps for the first 30 lessons, which will be 30 weeks of lessons. I think there's actually 35 of them. The first 35 weeks of lessons in a mind map format where you have a, a central theme. And then within that theme, you teach all of your core subjects. So English, science, math, social sciences, art, music, etc get the idea. And so the mind map represents the core theme. You've got all the different stuff that you're teaching around that core theme. And then we're designing it so it can be taught to any age group so that you're not limited <clears throat> by somebody's age. If you've got a kid that really, really excels, you want to be able to challenge that kid. You don't want to limit them based on their peers. And if you have a kid that needs a little bit more work, you want to be able to have, have, have um, skill-based or ability-based <clears throat> education program for them as well. And so this model is really nice in that it addresses that, and even better than that is it's meant to be a multi-age classroom. It doesn't have to be, but it's perfect for creating a multi-age classroom where you have older kids that can be really, really challenged, or even adults that could be challenged in a classroom like this, as well as uh, good content for really little kids. So everybody, there's something there for everyone. And so all that's moving along. We finished this last week. We finished our geography research is done, and we're researching the icons, as I already said. So, um, yeah, Education for Life program, that's moving along. I hope to have, we hope to have, um, our uh, first completed mind map. And I would love to be able to share that uh, this next week, So as well as the first of the completed um, molecules, uh, the first of the complete subject timelines you can see like I said last week we posted what a kind of a started template looks like but that was just and I held it up last week matter of fact I still got it sitting here on my desk so oh it's all whited out because of the too much light there you go you can see it in the shadow anyway the point is you can see it on the website and we were just looking at well what does this look like when we print it out on a piece of paper and you know how is that going to work so we can create portfolios for students and be able to use it as a usable tool and so I'd like to have one of those finished within the next couple of weeks. I'd love it if it was finished next week, but we'll see. So working on that. And then last but certainly not least, I talked about how we updated the stages of community building page and the true community page. And so true community is creating an environment of, well, ultimately of unconditional love. But really it's an environment of, of um, you know, that concept is so esoteric and hard for people to grasp, some people to grasp and um, unbelievable for other folks. And so maybe a better way to say it is, is it's an environment of maximum creativity, cooperation, collaboration, and feedback, where people are hungry for feedback, where they're open to feedback, they're excited about feedback, and they're working together to, um, to help each other evolve and grow uh, as much as possible and to contribute to the global environment. And so this is the environment, this is a big component 
of our teacher demonstration model um, that we're that we're working to share and to evolve and to develop. And so those two pages, the the stages of community building, which are the four stages based on M. Scott Peck's book, A Different Drum, which is all about community building. And he ran community building exercises and classes for groups of up to 500 and showed how you can achieve true community in a group of in a group of 500 people. Amazing. And so um, if you want to see what those four stages are, uh, pseudo-community and chaos and emptiness, if you want to see what those are and read about those, those pages have been updated with the details on that, as well as the True Community page, which talks about really exactly what true community is and why you why we're so dedicated to achieving it and how we look at that that the process of actually achieving it and how we're dedicated to it and the different components that one community is committed to. The consensus governing model, um, which uses small consensus groups to arrive at large consensus decisions um, so that everybody's voice is heard, as well as the highest good society model, fulfilled living model, community contribution model, all these different details. You know, years of research, uh, over a decade of research went into the design of these details and it's been confirmed by several other people who also did years of research and actually came to the almost identical conclusion. And so um, that's a pretty, it's, it's pretty amazing. And so, um, yeah, those pages are updated. We'd love to check, love you, for you to check it out. And, uh, you know, this is, this is what we're doing. This is our update for the week of November 4th, 2013, Building Open Source Sustainable Civilizations. This is what we're doing. We're doing it right now. And if anybody, the number one thing, I like to always finish these videos off, the number one thing, there's two things that people can do right now if you'd like to really help us create this. You know, if this idea of creating a world that works for everybody, if the idea of being able to go to the Philippines right now in its decimation and be able to build sustainable infrastructure to rebuild that country in, in a way, in that whole area, in a way that it could be um, sustainable and last to be able to rebuild to be able to rebuild anywhere area that's that's stricken by um, destruction like that or to start new versions of sustainable living all around the world or just to take the sustainable components and integrate them into the individual lives of anybody that would like to do this and would like an easier way a more affordable way because everything's free shared and open source and to see this whole industry of sustainability evolve as an open source industry and to, to bring people to it because we're making it easier. If this idea makes sense and is something that you want to participate, one of the greatest ways that you, to, you can help us out is by getting in contact with us and letting us know that you want to participate. We're looking for help. We're looking for people that want to volunteer. Our organization is 100% volunteer, unpaid staff, self-included, and we're here to create positive and permanent change for the highest good of all life on this planet. And we're doing the best that we can. And anybody that would like to participate is more than welcome. We've got lots of different options. You can become a community pioneer, people that are actually going to move to the property and build everything that we're working on right now. You can become a satellite pioneer, the people that are part of our team that join us on our weekly calls, that are part of all of our collaborative meetings and all the different details and evolving one community and working with it in that way, but intend to build it somewhere else. Or you can join us as a partner or a consultant, somebody that's consulting with our project but doesn't have any desire to move to the property and doesn't have any desire to necessarily start a version on the other side uh, somewhere else. They're just someone that you, know, someone who, who has knowledge that you know could help with, with what we're doing and wants to contribute that. Specifically, we're looking for engineers right now, and we'd love to add even more people to our amazing 3D team. So, um, But lots of other op options of what we're looking for on our updates page on our website. Or just go to onecommunityglobal.org forward slash helping, and you can see all the different ways to participate. And then, of course, just participate by sharing our stuff sharing everything that we're doing on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, even on Pinterest, you know, on Reddit, all this stuff. Get, get the word, help us get the word out. You know, the more people know about what it is that we're doing, the more, uh, the more the idea will spread and the faster we'll be able to develop this, the faster we'll be able to create everything that needs to be created to share, to open source and free share even more and even better and even faster. And so in addition to that, I said there are two ways that people could help. The second way is that we are still seeking funding to buy the property that we have been working 
with, for the last three years, developing the relationship with the county, um, designing our business plan around it. Choose, we chose a location that would have maximum availability for people to come and visit. Within the first six months, we can start inviting people to come out and see what it is that we're doing to participate. We'll be organized enough to have weekend work crews and week work crews where people come out and they can actually start learning the different uh, techniques and technologies and, and sharing and what it is that we're creating and taking the open source blueprints, but also getting hands-on experience with everything that we're working on at that point. Uh, the property that we chose took us two years to find it. It was chosen for that purpose. It was chosen to be a place that would be able to be expanded to the degree that we want to expand it, to create everything that we want to create um, that would allow us to share everything that we're doing easily without people having to fly out of the country to try and get to it so people can drive and have the experience of one community for less than the cost of a stay at Best Western to be able to experience the complete full immersion social architecture and the live music and the recreational aspects and the building, the sustainability and the food and all these details to be able to bring people and say, wow, look at this. When you build sustainable infrastructure, look at the education our kids are getting. Look at the highest good for business and for profit and nonprofit business models. Look at this. You can duplicate this too. You can create this and start giving people opportunity, addressing the very foundations, the very infrastructure, the very essence of where policy and the decisions in this world right now are being made from and alleviating the stressors that are creating the most destructive, arguably the most destructive things in our society right now. Poverty, hunger, starvation, you know, uh, issues with crime, all this stuff. You know, biological diversity destruction. Instead, start regenerating all these things and creating infrastructure that simultaneously addresses all of this stuff and is free shared and open source to duplicate and to evolve and modify and adapt in whatever way you want. So if you want to see what we're doing and you want to participate, look at the details of what we're creating. If you want to get involved, get involved. Otherwise, we would love it if you or someone you know might have a way to connect us to the funding that we're seeking to be able to get that property off the market. It would take our project to a whole new level and would accelerate the whole process that we're creating, everything that we're creating, open source and free shared uh, even faster. So with that, as always, I will say thank you very much for your support. Thanks for the great letters that we get. Thank you for sharing our stuff. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you like what it is that we're doing, you'd love to see our weekly updates, check out our blog, take a look at our website, see everything that we're doing. We're on all the different social media networks. Twitter is one community org. If you want to check that out, I already mentioned our Facebook pages. And as always, until next week, Thanks for following our project. Thanks for your support. And uh, keep living for the highest good of all. Thanks. <laughs>